to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich Yet for your sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9. We welcome you today to our study of the book of 2 Corinthians. In this epistle, we have mentioned that Paul is trying to defend his apostleship. He wants the Corinthians to see that he is committed to spreading the word of God and doing this mission work for the right reason. But along the way, he offers them so much comfort and hope, and we want to focus on those practical lessons in our study today. And so we invite you to find your Bible and have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God together. We're so glad that you've joined us, and as always, we hope that you'll uh, study with us every time we bring to you the Word of God from the Scripture. And we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Churches of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question or you'd like to study the Word of God more, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Scriptures with you. Friend, you'll find people in the Lord's Church who love God, who are concerned about the Word of God, and who want to help people get to heaven. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we also want to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can visit our website. From there, there is a wide variety of good Bible study material, thegospelofchrist.com. We have audio lessons, video lessons, just a wide variety of good Bible study resources, and it's all available to you free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our lessons, you can also download them free of charge, or if you need a DVD or a CD, we'll send that to you free as well. And friend, we just hope today that as we study the Word of God together, each one of us will be encouraged and uplifted, and that we'll put our faith in God, not in men. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul begins by talking about the example of the Macedonians as good givers. And friend, we're going to speak a lot in this lesson on the subject of giving because that's the context of much of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. But let me preface our lesson today saying this. We're not begging you for money. We're not out to get in your wallet. We're not, uh, in the sense, trying to uh, make you feel guilty and give us money. That's not the idea, nor is that the idea of the context. The context of this giving is uh, individuals giving at their local congregation on an individual level as part of the worship. And so I want you to understand from the outset, as we talk about giving, please don't think we're trying to beg you for money. That's not the idea. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're concerned about your soul, but we also want to say what the Bible says about the Christian as an act of praising God, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, on the first day of the week in his local congregation, giving to God. And so having said that, notice the powerful example of the Macedonians and their giving. These Macedonians were great givers and they gave out of deep poverty to God and his cause. Look in 2 Corinthians 8. I want you to notice what Paul says in verses 2 and 4. Paul says that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, that is the Macedonians, and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Paul says, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. You know, when I think about these Macedonians, they, they gave out of deep poverty. They gave with their ability and above their ability. They're helping Paul spread the gospel and they're supporting him in his missionary endeavors. And ultimately, they're giving to the cause of Christ. 
You know, this example reminds me of someone else in the New Testament. I want you to hold your finger in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And would you flip over to Luke 21 for just a minute. I want you to read with me from Luke chapter 21, a powerful example of someone in the New Testament who is such a great giver to God. Look in Luke chapter 21. Look with me in verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, And Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all, for all these out of their abundance have put in offerings to God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. Can you imagine that here's Jesus at the temple. People are coming up and they're giving their offering. And the rich, they're putting out of their abundance. You can see them coming with their big coffers pouring in and the massive noise it would have meant. Boy, that man put in a lot. Did you hear how long it took for his to fill up? And then this little widow comes by. Clank, clank. Just two mites. And everybody probably looked around a little embarrassed, didn't they? Is that all she had to give? Couldn't she have done better than that? You know what Jesus said? She outdid all the rest of you. Why? She, out of her poverty, gave her whole livelihood. You, out of your abundance, gave the abundance to God, and she gave her whole life. She gave more than anybody else because it hurt her to give. She wasn't just giving out of her uh, leftovers. She gave everything she had to God. When I think about these Macedonians, such powerful givers. They gave everything they had. They represent God in His giving. God so loved the world, He gave His best, His only begotten Son. And so I think about these people and the great act of giving that they had to God, and I think, what are we giving to God? And friend, again, we're talking about on an individual and congregational level. What are we giving to God? Are we giving God the best, or are we just giving God the leftovers? You know, what is it? Think about this with me for a moment. What is it? that made these Macedonians such great givers? And the answer is found in verse number 5. These Macedonians were first givers because they'd already given themselves to the Lord first. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 5. The Bible says, And not only as we hoped, now listen to this, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us, by the will of God. What makes a person a good giver? Well, you've got to give yourself first. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friend, to be a good giver, I first have to give myself to God. Once I devote and commit myself fully to God, friend, it's not hard to support and give financially uh, to God as a part of our worship as well. But as we think about this chapter about giving, really two chapters about giving, part of the depth of our giving is uh, the proof of how deep our love for God and others really is. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This expresses the depth of our giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want you to notice what Paul says in verse number 8. Paul says, I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. The sincerity of our love is somehow indicated by the depth of our giving. We're not talking about quantity per se, but the rate of it, how much we give to God, how much we give our, and not just financially. Do we give our time? Do we give our effort? Do we give our energy? Are we trying to help the cause of Christ physically? Are we giving financially? Are we putting our, our, our mind and our intellect to use in the kingdom of God? And somehow that necessitates the sincerity of our commitment to Christ. And so Paul says the, the depth of our giving is a, a good proof of our sincerity and our deep love for God and for other people. Does that mean the person who doesn't give much? No. Remember the poor widow? She only gave two mites. But the depth of her giving was surely seen in that because it was everything she had. 
She gave till it hurt. And friend, the Macedonians are seen in that way. Now, Paul is then going to think about, as we mentioned the idea of giving, Paul is going to backtrack for a minute, and he's going to think about God as the supreme giver. I want you to open in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9 with me, and I want you to notice, this is probably one of my favorite passages in all the New Testament. Look at 2 Corinthians 8, verse number 9. For you know the grace, and grace here is used synonymously with giving, the giving of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. You want to really be a good giver? Think about what God did. You know the grace. You know the giving of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you mean? Though he was rich. Friend, Jesus was in the very place that we are fighting the good fight of faith every day about to go. He was in that place, and he gave that up. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes, because of other people, because of us, he became poor. He came to this land of sin and sorrow, didn't even have a place to call his own. And why did he do that? That we, through his poverty, might one day be made rich. Look at what Jesus gave up and came to this land and lived as a pauper so that one day through his poverty we could be rich? Friend, if that doesn't motivate us to give, then I don't know what will. Christ had it all, and yet God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Paul then says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who did not consider it robbery to be made equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, coming in the form of a, a servant, a bondservant, in the likeness of man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Jesus left heaven, came to this earth, faced some of the most horrible circumstances you could ever imagine, and he did all of that. Because that's how much he wanted to give. For me and you to have the hope and the joy of heaven? Friend, you talk about a motivating factor to giving. There it is. When we think about what God gave up, when we think about what Christ gave, you're not going to have to beg somebody to help the cause of Christ. You're not going to have to beg somebody uh, to give to the Lord's cause. Someone who really considers and contemplates and understands what God and the Lord Jesus Christ gave up for them, that's not going to be a stingy person. They're going to be happy to help the cause of Christ and the will of God ultimately in every way that they can. But you know, as we think about giving, Paul is going to give some commands here. He's going to give some advice here about how to give in the proper way, proper attitude, proper heart, proper means. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, we're told uh, that we're to purpose in our heart. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I want you to notice what the Bible says about giving in verses 6 and 7. Paul says, But this I say, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Basically here the idea is that of reaping and sowing. Uh, if we give purposefully, if we give bountifully, God's going to take care and bless His people, but if we're stingy and grudging, that's not the way God wants us to be. And so Paul says each one needs to purpose in his heart. What does it mean to purpose in your heart? Does that mean that when I get there on Sunday, that just whatever I've got, I can make up my mind. I've got a $50 bill in my wallet. I can, it's divided into uh, two 20s and a 10. I'm going to make up my mind right now to give God one of those 20s. Is that purposing in your heart? No, that's not the idea. It's not making up your mind on the spot. What does it mean to purpose in our heart? Purpose in your heart means we, we follow the inspired example of others. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 2. The Macedonians gave so powerfully. They gave uh, freely. They gave out of love to God. It means we contemplate. It, the text tells us what it means. We follow the example of other good givers in the Bible, like the Macedonians. We follow the example 
of the giving of Christ, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, who gave everything for us to go to heaven, and we factor that in with our ability. What has God blessed us with? Friend, when I think about purposing in my heart, I want to, I want to do it from my heart. I want to have the right attitude and mindset, but I also want to give based on what God has given me. And so I think about my ability. What has God given me? How has the Lord blessed us? What talents, what income, what uh, blessings do we have? And we want to factor all of that, and we want to give to God first, not last. In Malachi chapter 3, there's an illustration that I often think of. Malachi 1 and Malachi 3, uh, basically in the context, the people are bringing uh, the leftovers to God. And so instead of bringing the best of the flock or the best of the lamb or the heifer to offer as a sacrifice, they're bringing the lame and the maimed and the hurt and the sick. Couldn't do anything with that anyway. We may as well give it to God as an offering. And God says, give it to your governor. You want to give this sick, lame animal to me? Well, you go give that to your governor and see what he'd think about it. He wouldn't like that. And so God says, don't give me the leftovers. Give God your best. Give Him the first fruits is what we find in the Bible. And as we purpose in our heart, we want to follow the pattern of good givers. We want to follow the example of Christ. And we want to give within our ability and our means to do that to the Lord and to His work. And friend, as we think about that idea, it's not just purposing and making a decision in our heart, but it's also doing it with the right attitude and mindset. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I want you to notice what the Bible says. I want you to look in verses 7 and 8 again. Paul says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, so that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Why is it that we give to God? When the plate comes around, we go, Oh boy, I've got to give something, or I'll go to hell. No, that's not the idea. I don't give, oh, here it comes. I guess I better put something in, grudge it. Oh, I better put it in. Or if I don't do this, I'm going to be No, we don't give grudgingly or of necessity. How does God want us to give? God wants us to give cheerfully. What's that mean? Friend, it, the Greek word is hilario, and that's where we get the word hilarious from. Christians, it ought to be as though we're excited and we could laugh out loud to give to God. It ought to thrill our souls to give back to the, the cause of God and the cause of all that God has done for me. What a joy and how happy it makes me that I can help the cause of Christ, that I can give back to the work of the Lord. You see, God willingly gave His Son, as we mentioned, John 3, 16. Jesus, for the joy set before Him, endured the cross, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 the motivation of the salvation of my soul by the blood of Jesus Christ and the love of God ought to make me so joyful to give back to God and to His cause. And so not only do we want to make the right purpose in our heart, but I want to do it with the right attitude. I want to give to God based on all that God has given to me. But friend, in view of that, Paul is going to remind these Christians of the greatest gift of all. Look at verse number 15. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I want you to notice what Paul says. Kind of sums up this idea of giving, and Paul says these words. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Greatest gift ever. What is it? The gift of God's Son. Hebrews 10, 3 and 4 says the blood of bulls and goats could never really take away sin. Uh, the Bible tells us that man left to himself could not save himself. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 14, 12. Uh, we needed God's help. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10, verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And so when I think about what is the greatest single gift anybody's ever, can you imagine, let's say somebody left a million dollars to the church. Nah, doesn't even compare. That isn't a drop in the bucket to the greatest gift ever. Greatest gift ever is God giving His Son. Thanks be to God for His indescribable, can't even begin to fathom what a great gift the gift of His Son is. Think about it this way. I've got children, maybe you've got children as well. Can, as a father, I believe part of my responsibility is to uh, protect 
and make sure that my children stay out of harm's way to the best of my ability. Can you imagine as a father intentionally and willfully sending your son into harm's way for other people? Think about that for a moment. That's exactly what God did. That's exactly what Christ agreed to do. When we say thanks be to God for His indescribable gift, not even something that I can hardly begin to comprehend what God did for me and you. Thus, God wants us to purpose in our heart, to be cheerful givers, to give liberally and without reproach. And that will ultimately bring glory and honor to Almighty God. One of the more beautiful passages that we'll find in the New Testament about Christ is actually found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. We talk about Christ and we think about His life, but what kind of person is the Lord Jesus described as in the Bible? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's a different picture than what you might have seen before. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 1. Paul says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold toward you. You know, we learn about Paul's uh, way of pleading with these people, but we also learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. When I think about the gentleness of Jesus, the meekness of Jesus, I can't help but think about the words of Acts chapter 8 and Isaiah 53. He was led as a lamb before its shearers is silent. He committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in his mouth. He said, do you not know that I could call down ten legions of angels? And yet he remained silent because that's how much he loved man. The meekness, the, the strength under control, the gentleness, the willingness to go along with the will of God. Paul says, this is the attitude that I'm coming to you with. I could come another way. But this is the attitude and the approach that I'm taking. Meekness, of course, as we mentioned, is strength under control. He was God, but he humbled himself became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 9. The word gentleness carries with it the idea of, of uh, courteous or uh, sweet reasonableness is another way that it's used. That he was, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 10 to his disciples, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. That's the idea. Didn't fight back when he was assaulted. Didn't mock back when he was mocked. Didn't spit back when he was spit at. Sweet reasonableness, gentleness. That's the idea that we find in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And friend, based on that, Paul will encourage us in this physical life to have that type of attitude and mindset as we fight the spiritual battle that we're all going to face. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5 through 5 with me. Though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Paul is saying, I want you to have the, the meekness and the gentleness of Christ because you're going to face some things. One of those things you're going to face is this spiritual battle. You've got the weaponry. You've got the tools. You've got the perfect captain of the army, Hebrews 2 verse 9. The enemy's already been defeated, Hebrews 2 verse 14. You now have to have the, the meekness, the gentleness, the self-control to put one foot in front of the other and to fight the good fight of faith, to take up the whole armor of God, and to resist Satan and all his adversaries as God wants us to do. Friends, as you think about this battle, a couple of things to mention here. Our weapons are not physical weapons. Um, in my spiritual battle against evil, I'm not going to take out an AK-47 and shoot Satan and all the demons of hell. That's, that's not the idea here. Uh, I'm not going to go around and create violence toward... No, that's not the idea either. Our weapons are not physical, but spiritual. What's that mean? We take up the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, verses 13 through 17. We have the mind of Christ. 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. We, we live as God wants us to live every day in such a way that we're fighting that spiritual battle with the right attitude, right mindset, and right weapons. And friend, here's the good news. These weapons outlined in Ephesians 6 verses 13 through 18, there's no doubt about it. Satan doesn't even stand a chance against you and against me with God's help. How do we know that? 1 John 4 verse 4, John says, He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. 1 John 5 verse 4, talking about one of those weapons, the shield of the faith, John says this is the victory we have, even our faith. And so when we take up the whole armor of God, Satan doesn't even stand a chance against God's people, and we truly can bring glory and honor to God by doing that. Now, as we think about this idea, if how would we live this life in such a way how do, we, how do we win the battle? How can we be victorious? By giving ourselves, by giving of our time, by giving in such a way that it honors God, but also by living our life in such a way that we can have the confidence as we follow Christ into victory and into battle, we'll also be victorious. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, For to this were you called, because Christ also suffered and died for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in His footsteps. As I follow the captain of my salvation, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 2, verse 9. Friend, it's impossible. I hope this encourages you as much as it does me. As I follow the Lord, as I do what the Bible says, as I put my trust and hope in Him, as I put my footsteps in the steps of the Savior, it's impossible for Christians not to go to heaven if they do that. Don't you believe that? Isn't that encouraging? And so our, our comfort to you today and our encouragement is, if you're not a child of God, friend, we beg you to become one. If you've never obeyed the gospel, then we kindly ask in the words of Ananias to Saul of Tarsus, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, verse 16. And to every Christian, keep giving of yourself. Keep giving to, the, to God in the ways that He has outlined in the Bible. And every day, keep fighting the good fight of faith. We hope you'll join us next time as we'll conclude our study of 2 Corinthians together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.